Hi everybody and welcome to another geospatial webinar sponsored today by TomTom and including content from their partners at Pitney Bowes Software and Autodesk. Today, as the title suggests, we're going to get a fairly in-depth look at a case study involving all three companies' technology used for a major redevelopment project in San Francisco, the Presidio Parkway. I'm Nora Parker, webinar producer at Directions, and I'll be moderating today. Behind the scenes helping me push buttons is my colleague Lynette Qualia. So if you have any questions or technical difficulties during the webinar, ping us via the chat interface and we should be able to help. And uh, thanks to uh, Mary who has already pinged me and asked if the presentation will be archived and accessible at a later date. And I do want to let everybody know that we are recording today and we will be sending out a thank you note tomorrow with, um, with that link to the recording. So thanks Mary for that question. And now I just want to show you a quick map of everybody who has registered for today's webinar. Um, as you can see, we have a very wide geographic distribution of attendees today, with six out of seven continents represented. And we have um, just about 400, just a little bit more than 450 of you registered. So it's great to have all of you here. Um, it's so wonderful to have so many people interested in this topic, and I'm glad you are because when I saw this demo, I was kind of floored, so I thought it was really cool. So anyways, just a quick word about directions in case you're not familiar. Oh, hi, Sean. You, you don't see your dot in Alaska. I'm so sorry. You must have not geocoded. <laughs> um, but it's good to have you here, and to all of the others of you here, we've got several Jeremy's on, a Gene. Uh, a couple of Jasons, uh, Doug, Diana, Dino, um, um, uh, quite a few of you are already on the call. But if you're not familiar with Directions, I want to just mention that we are best known for our comprehensive online publication, Directions Magazine, and for our newsletter. It comes out on Thursdays. We're also involved in conferences and webinars, so please do visit us at directionsmag.com. One webinar, or excuse me, one conference that we have coming up um, in about a month is the Location Intelligence Conference in Washington, D.C. So if you are around there and are interested in that uh, topic, um, please do check out that conference. It's going to be um, uh, in tandem with the Oracle Spatial Users Conference. And so I have Jose saying hello to me. Thanks, Jose, for chiming in there. I appreciate that. So first, a few housekeeping details. We encourage you to ask questions, and we'll do our best to address as many of them as possible. And you, many of you have already found how to ask those questions just in your chat window there. You can also send me a tweet at DirectionsMag and include the hashtag TomTomWebinar. I'll be keeping an eye up on that as well. And I'm going to put a URL um, for you to access a PDF copy of the slides, as well as a link to the um, bios for our speakers. And I'll pop those into the chat um, interface as soon as I finish talking. And we're going to be taking a few polls during today's webinar. And we'll walk you through those when we get to them. In fact, we've got four today, so stay tuned for, for those. And as I mentioned, today's webinar is being recorded, and all registrants will receive an email with instructions on how to view the recording on demand. And it's also handy if you want to pass that email along to, to colleagues of yours who missed the webinar but might be interested in that. And we'll get that out to you as quickly as we can, hopefully tomorrow. We do have a, an exit survey as well as you leave the webinar. You can give us some feedback on how you think we did today and some other webinars um, that, um, uh, excuse me, other, other topics for webinars that you think might be um, of interest. And so now I want to get to your first poll for the, to the first poll and get your, um, get your responses on this one. We're wondering if you use traffic data at all. So the choices that you have here are, yes, I use traffic data for my job. Yes, I use it personally but not for work. Or no, I don't use traffic data at all. So I'm coming to this webinar just to get a little bit of background on um, on uh, the topic of the redevelopment project that we have today. So anyways, looks like quite a few have already voted. Now, I would put myself into the, yes, I use it personally, not for work, you know, on my, on my smartphone when I get stuck in a uh, traffic jam. That's definitely the first thing I do is pull that out and take a look at the real-time data there that's coming in. 
and I know Mike's going to be talking a little bit about that. So anyways, it looks like I'm going to go ahead and give you a couple more seconds to answer this poll. And uh, if you haven't responded, please go ahead and do so. I'm going to close it up in three, two, one, blast off. Okay, let me go ahead and share the results with you. About 40% of you are um, actively using um, traffic data in your job, and almost the same number have not used traffic data yet, and then another 22% of you use it personally. Great, so that is a nice cross, um, um, cross uh, of uh, different interests in traffic data there. So anyways, now let me introduce everybody to Mike Danahy. We've done quite a few webinars together, and I think I could almost read your bio, Mike, by heart. But um, for those of you who don't know Mike, he's been with TomTom Tom for eight years, and he currently works as a pre-sales consultant. And that means he's help, involved in helping potential customers figure out their needs and how TomTom Tom might be able to help. Thanks so much for being here again with us um, today, Mike. Good to have you. Thank you very uh, much, Nora. It's, uh, it's great to be back. And uh, also thank you uh, to everyone who has joined uh, either this morning, this afternoon, this evening. Uh, really great to see that we've got a, a truly global audience with us today. Um, maybe someday we'll see someone in Antarctica, but I, uh, I didn't see that. And uh, I would imagine we probably don't have any addressing there. Ah, that's uh, the problem there. There probably are people on Antarctica on this webinar. We just don't see them on the map. <laughs> lots of penguins, I'm sure. Um, and uh, also thanks in advance to Ahmed and, and Justin for joining us today. I think they've got some really interesting insights into how the, their software is used to really mine and use data <clears throat> in some very productive and interesting ways. Um, just a little bit of background on TomTom. Tom. We're really a world leader in geospatial products and services. Of course, we're very well known for our GPS devices, but we're really much more than that. Um, we're a mapping company with over 30 years of experience, this through acquisitions such as Teleatlas, GDT, and ETAC. Uh, so we have a lot of experience in routing attribution, mapping, uh, point of interest, census data, 2D and 3D map visualization, which we'll talk about later today. And we really are pioneers when it comes to traffic data collection, fusion, and productization. We're based out of beautiful Amsterdam, but we also have over 3,500 employees across the world. Uh, and this is very important in, it, in that it allows us to have local expertise in the field. This is important for data collection and data validation, and really allows us superior global geographic coverage. TomTom Tom is currently comprised of four externally facing business units, uh, the first of which is our consumer division. And though we're not just a GPS company, we certainly have that component. Um, and we've recently completed, uh, I think, really a complete reinvention of the PND or the personal navigation device. And this will be hitting the shelves very soon. It's something we're very proud of, uh, complete rethinking of the software. Uh, we're also entering into the sports watch market, uh, motorcycle navigation, and we're even coming out with a new com commuter specific product uh, that sometime in the second half of this year. Automotive is also a very important market segment for us. We're a trusted partner for both automakers and OEMs. Uh, we're expanding heavily into this market and we have some new software bundling that will be coming out uh, to uh, help those partners. Um, and this is really providing driver-centric products based on re recent developments to our platforms and services. And, of course, we're certainly now a world leader in traffic, which is very important for the automotive industry. In our business solutions uh, unit, this is our fastest growing business unit at this time. Uh, we provide fleet track and trace as well as navigation solutions. And then in the lower right-hand corner, you can see uh, is our licensing business unit. And this is the business unit that I'm a member of. And we're really responsible for selling that whole range of back-end technology to our partners. And this is where our partnership comes in with Pitney Bowes and indirectly with Autodesk. <clears throat> Very important to TomTom Tom are our core assets. Again, we're not just GPS, and we're really not just traffic or maps either. Uh, we also sell address points. Uh, we have a lot of advanced driver assistance attribution for intelligent navigation. We have decades of geocoding experience, sports watch technology, uh, again, port, uh, points of interest, smartphone application, 
and 2D and 3D city models, which we'll be talking about again. And then also some location-based services, which are available through an online developer portal. And we're productizing all of these core assets in really new and meaningful ways, which we license to our partners uh, who are bringing innovative location-based intelligence uh, to the market through their software tools, and this is to serve the needs of their end users. And Pitney Bowes and Autodesk will really illustrate how this become, can be done uh, you know, for really intelligent and efficient infrastructure planning and design. I'd like to talk a little bit about our traffic. As Nora mentioned earlier, I feel we're really best in class at this time for both real-time and historical traffic. We're six years now of pioneering development, uh, this done under an engineering fellow. We have seven engineering fellows in a company of over 3,500, so one of these fellows is in charge of this. Uh, we've collected well over six trillion data points to this, uh, this date done so anonymously and voluntarily through our uh, end users. Uh, we have over 100 million connected GPS devices in the field today collecting data for us for our real-time traffic. And we also have a best-in-class data fusion engine, which of course developed uh, as headed by this engineering fellow, which we're extremely proud of. And of course, this is very useful for dynamic routing, for traffic planning centers, and, and really I feel for use cases that we've not even thought of yet. And I, and I really feel, as of today, our live traffic is the best out there. Um, 2D and 3D city models, this is going to be an important component um, of our presentation today. And this is really part of our core business. We're really, in, in many ways, a data provisioning company. Um, and, and part of this is our photorealistic uh, data, which you see pictured here. This is actually the city of Boston. Um, so we're really experts in collecting, verifying, and fusing data, and then presenting this data in very usable formats for our customers. And though this is extremely resource intensive and difficult, uh, we have these you know, years and years of experience in that we can do this now very elegantly, intelligently, and in doing that, meeting the highest quality standards out there. So our data taken in whole really integrates seamlessly Map data aligns perfectly with traffic data, which in turn aligns, that's aligned seamlessly with 2D and 3D data. And this provides contiguous broad cover, coverage, which is really easily integrated into our partner software, which we'll see uh, coming up. So today we, uh, we're really uh, focusing on the partnership here. And we'll see how our partners utilize this data in, in really good ways, in meaningful ways in order to facilitate real-world analysis, planning, and design. And again, this brings us to the value of partnership. TomTom Tom and Pitney Bowes have a long history, really decades-long relationship, going all the way back to the days of GDT uh, through Teleatlas, uh, back in the days of MapInfo. Um, Tom Tom and Autodesk, we also benefit from an indirect relationship through Pitney Bowes. Um, and TomTom, Tom, as a single source data provider, uh, really allows our partners to spend less time rectifying data issues by providing, again, to contiguous, high-quality global coverage. And this really affords them more time to develop those innovative tools and technologies which allow for the, the, the efficient analysis of the data. Um, so we're looking at very powerful geospatial analysis and then also display of design concepts, which Pitney Bowes and Autodesk will cover. So now let's get to the good stuff. Let's get on to uh, Pitney Bowes and Autodesk in the next segment of our presentation. Excellent. Thanks so much, um, Mike. Really appreciate that overview. Now I want to introduce everybody to Dr. Ahmed Abukater, uh, GISP. He's an architect, designer, and planner by trade. He's currently serving as the Global Director of Product Management at Pitney Bowes Software. And I just want to mention to everybody, you might notice that he has uh, his GISP certification. And um, our webinar today is good towards your EDU 3.4, your GISP certification. So if you want to send me an email after the webinar, if you are going for that certification and could use the certificate, um, we'll have Lynette get one out to you. Um, so anyways, Ahmed, now over to you. Thanks so much for being here today. Thanks, Nora. Uh, glad to be here. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon and good evening, wherever you are. Um, I wanted to speak about this partnership in relation to the overall industry landscape and the target audience we're trying to serve. Uh, this partnership came to life because 
we wanted to eliminate redundancies in the workplace while fostering better decision making and collaborative um, environment among different stakeholders. Uh, this partnership is intended to serve users in uh, state and local government agencies as well as the AEC industry at large. Um, as you can see here, um, the process of planning and design has different scales ranging from the local, what we call the small D design, to the regional or the big D design, and also involves multiple levels of governments, including architects, uh, community planners, economic developers, site designers, um, asset managers, and uh, this is, of course, in addition to the general public and the community at large. So we have different stakeholders. We have different uh, scale and size variation, uh, different data sets and uh, workflows. And we also have a variety of, of, of technology providers and data requirements. On one side, uh, we, we have um, Autodesk for design and BIM, or building information ma uh, modeling. And on the other side, uh, we have uh, PTBO software map info for location intelligence and planning and analysis. So when we talk about 3D analysis, for example, and visualization, it can mean different uh, things uh, depending on the scale uh, in which we operate. For example, uh, at the local scale, uh, it, it can mean 3D visualization and rendering and augmented reality of, of buildings, which is an Autodesk uh, play. But at the regional scale, it can mean 3D analytics, uh, which is a map info play. And TomTom, of course, provides uh, data to support um, various scales and operations. And regardless of audience variation or differences in scale or technology, people in general, in general uh, need to do analysis, visualize results, and share the outcome of their analysis with a wider audience, internal or external to their organizations. So we need a common way of diagnosing the problem and generating and evaluating solutions and options. And, options. and, 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 and all of this needs to be done uh, and accomplished in a, in, in a collaborative fashion so organizational and departmental silos can be eliminated. So with smart technology, businesses and governments can also be smart about evaluating the problem, making informed decisions, and executing intelligent strategies that will enable them ultimately to achieve their business goals. All right, so, so today uh, at Pitney Bowes Map Info, we are celebrating 10 years of location intelligence, which is a term that we coined 10 years ago, and it is really the pulse and the DNA of GIS today. As I mentioned, we have the BIM world of, of Auto, Auto, Autodesk, and the GIS world of Pitbull Software Map Info. And historically, these solutions were not connected very well. And so our users had difficulty in, in managing their data and workflows as a result of that. Uh, we have uh, planners who are heavily relying on GIS and designers who are heavily relying on BIM. And this disconnect between the GIS world and, and the CAD world created many challenges in, manage, in managing the project life cycle. And it also created delays in its implementation. Now, these challenges cannot be trivialized when we are talking about large-scale infrastructure and redevelopment projects that require precision and cost-saving measures, as well as collaborative decision-making. And this is what this partnership is all about. It's about connecting the dots and stitching BIM and GIS workflows and facilitating uh, seamless data flow across different design and analysis products. And uh, the result is a more productive and collaborative government and a streamlined and more efficient planning and design process. This is where the design uh, and the analysis meet and where the GIS and, and BIM converge. And we, we have seen an increasing demand uh, for us to combine our technology together and deliver this comprehensive end-to-end uh, -end solution to support government and infrastructure business workflows. This means combining uh, the analytical and strategic capabilities of Pitney Bowes location intelligence technology with the Autodesk's operational and mapping capabilities, particularly the, the visualization and design elements. So the idea here is to leverage both of our strengths in these different aspects of uh, uh, the project life cycle so we can ho holistically manage the project life cycle, including the planning, the design, building, and management in order to ultimately expedite the process of development. So this slide 
through this workflow. Um, we have invested significant amount of resources here in this partnership to integrate our technologies. And so with this partnership now our technology our technology is interoperable, which means that our products communicate and can talk to each other today. So no data conversion is needed. As a matter of fact, you can use um, your own data and you are using and consuming the same data, but from different angles and using different products. Analysis and planning can be conducted using the sophisticated computational capabilities and on-the-fly visualization of math info professional, while the de detailed design um, is done with the operational capabilities of Autodesk technology, including Math 3D and InfraWorks, as Justin will be showing us in a few minutes. So now let's take a look at a quick demo to illustrate how this works in real life. Uh, the demo has two components, the analytical component done by Pitney Bowes Map Info uh, technology which I will cover and the second part is the 3D visualization that Justin uh, from Autodesk will, will show us using Autodesk technology. You can see here uh, in the uh, top left hand side of your screen uh, the Golden Gate which is uh, uh, one of the city's most well-known landmark and um, a remarkable point of attraction. The community to the south end of, of, of it, it's called uh, Presidio Parkway. This community is significant because it's, um, because it's uh, sensitive ecosystems as well as um, its importance um, as a tourist point of attraction that makes it the gateway to San Francisco. So quickly, this is the tale of the, of, of the take. The problem here is that the main highway connecting the Golden Gate and the rest of San Francisco goes from four lanes to two lanes, and this of course created significant traffic congestion problems, with, which in turn isolated this community from, from the rest of, of the city. And the goal here, uh, the goal of this redevelopment project is to modernize the area and allow more traffic to move smoothly and connect this area to the rest of the city. To do that, the proposed development includes two components, widening the road and adding tunnels and parks in addition to building the Golden Gate Museum. So the first uh, thing in, in this workflow in, um, is basically planning an analysis. Um, and this analysis has two elements, traffic analysis and simulation, and suitability analysis using our flagship desktop product, Map Info Professional, to determine the best location for this proposed development. So this is the first part, as you can see, which is the traffic analysis. And we're using here Pitney Bowes software parameters technology. And the idea is, uh, is to look at traffic simulation and behavior uh, before and after widening the highway. And this is a, an after and before, as you can see. Um, and this shows the amount of traffic congestion. The larger the circle, the more traffic congestion and traffic delay we have. And this next slide shows that by widening the, the, the street and increasing its capacity from two lanes to four lanes um, and using tunnels and overpasses, traffic congestion um, has been greatly alleviated and jams are reduced. Um, those are uh, just uh, um, close-up um, uh, close shots of the most congested areas. As you can see, uh, the before and after simulations shows that we are able to reduce traffic delay significantly. So the second part of the analysis um, is used to determine the best location uh, for the proposed Golden Gate Museum. And for that, we conducted a visibility analysis using MapInfo Professional, which is our flagship um, desktop product for analysis. In this site suitability and selection analysis, we relied on multiple criteria evaluation, in which we considered a set of um, uh, environmental, socioeconomic uh, economic, um, uh, factors and these include uh, looking at uh, vacant land and min minimum uh, lot size, vicinity to major highways uh, to ensure connectivity, uh, vicinity to community assets such as uh, parks, for example, and hotels, public libraries, and educational and entertainment facilities. Uh, we also considered uh, relatively flat locations to reduce the amount of common fail and overall cost of the project. We also try to avoid prime agricultural land and sensitive environmental and floodplain areas. 
Uh, but we wanted to, uh, this development to, to serve areas of high population densities as well as communities with, uh, with higher educational attainment. Uh, so we created several heat maps, as you can see here, to present and represent these factors. And uh, then we combined them to create this suitability map that was also given to Justin to continue his analysis in a three-dimensional environment. And uh, with that, I would uh, hand it back over to Nora. Nora? Super. Thank you so much. That was really great. And I really especially like that last slide with the, uh, with the light table gymnastics est establishing suitability for the location of the museum. Um, really fascinating stuff. All right, so we have another poll for you guys. Um, and so this one we want to know, do you integrate um, 3D data into your GIS workflow? And we're specifically wondering if you do this to enable stakeholder engagement. Um, so in this case, we want to know, yes, I, I uh, integrate 3D data into my GIS workflow specifically to enable stakeholder engagement. or I uh, do integrate 3D data into my GIS workflow, but not for enabling stakeholder engagement. Or, of course, the third choice is um, none of the above, um, in which case you're probably here learning about how you might be able to do that. Um, so uh, Justin, in particular, is really interested in uh, stakeholder engagement. Um, as you can imagine, um, Autodesk software is used a lot for uh, visualization, uh, visualizing um, different options for, um, for how to proceed with redevelopment and other sorts of projects. Um, but anyway, so uh, we have this question. We're going to be following this one up in just a second with uh, what scale if you answered yes. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and close this uh, slide up, uh, close this um, poll up. Um, so if you haven't voted, please do so. OK, last couple people voting there. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and share the results. So about 20% of you, which is higher than I thought it would be, are already integrating 3D data into GIS workflow for uh, stakeholder engagement um, enablement. And then um, another um, almost 25% are using 3D data, but not necessarily for that purpose. And then almost 60% of you have not gotten to that um, yet. So I'm going to go ahead and do our next poll. So for those of you who said yes, um, and I think I'm going to go ahead and say yes, either for stakeholder engagement or for other workflows, tell us what scale you're um, working at. So is it at building scale, neighborhood scale, city scale, regional scale, or um, really two or more of the above? So go ahead and um, respond on that poll. And um, we're going to be bringing Justin in here in just a minute to talk through um, a little bit more on this Presidio Parkway case study. But I want to give you guys a few seconds more to respond on that. So let me go ahead and um, deal with a couple of comments that we were getting from the audience here while you do that. So just a reminder, I have put a uh, link to the PDF in your uh, chat box, so you can grab that and download the slides that we're looking at right now. Um, and it is the PDF version, so it should download pretty quickly for you. Um, and of course, I do have a couple people asking about the recording. We are recording the webinar. And I wanted to follow up on my um, comment about um, the GISP. If you do want a certificate um, uh, to use for your um, EDU three points for your GISP, um, application, do go ahead and send me an email. And let's see, it looks like most of you have voted on this one, or those of you who are, who are able to vote on this one have. So I'm going to close that and share these results. And um, uh, the biggest category here is two or more of the, of the scales. Um, so that's not too surprising. But um, a, uh, uh, most, um, most um, selected, if you were only going to select one, was a quarter of you chose neighborhood scale. And then about 15% city scale, or regional scale, and 7% actually need the building scale. All right, great. So we're going to go ahead and um, hide that. And we are going to bring in Justin now. Justin Locus is a senior product manager at Autodesk, responsible for strategy, business models, and the product roadmap for infrastructure modeling, cloud, and mobile products. Um, He's a busy guy, and we really appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. Justin, over to you. 
Yeah, thank you very much. So, you know, up, up until now we've been talking a lot about, uh, you know, both Mike had a lot to say about data and Ahmed obviously had a lot to say about how we use that data and software as part of the planning process for understanding where perhaps to, to do something, right? Plan infrastructure, maybe even plan buildings and things like that. At this point, we've been talking a lot about that in the context of 2D and maps, and really a lot of that is, has been upfront planning. But what if I was to say to you that in the future, and, and really the future starts now, we were able to explore what could be, explore all of these options in the context of what is. Uh, in other words, being able to take what many people call the art of the possible, what's possible in an area and actually show that, or even in the engineering field, we've been hearing a lot about optioneering, taking different engineered options and actually visualizing those, three, those in 3D. So next slide. So before we start that, I'd like to start this with a definition of and, and really a, a brief history of, of where we've been and, and, and where we are today and where we're going. Uh, it all starts out with, with something, a, a scene like this. Uh, this is a typical planning meeting. I, I grabbed this image out of the Birmingham News. A typical planning meeting, public planning meeting, you've got lots of stakeholder engagement. And the stakeholders are, are different people from different areas. They could be planners and, and others. And they're doing things like this. They're looking at 2D information. Uh, that 2D information may be in the form of blueprints or plotted uh, sheets. It may be slides uh, you know, in PowerPoint. Might be lots of different things. And often what they're looking at looks like this, and this is a 2D plan set, a civil engineering plan set for uh, um, an intersection and road widening. And the, the, what's, what's usually said in these meetings is, imagine if you will. Now, where that falls down, where imagine if you will doesn't work is, is just about every case, everyone imagines something very different. It, even if you're a bunch of civil engineers or architects sitting around these drawings and looking at these 2D plan sets, imagine if you will is something very different to you than it is to me. And seeing these things in, in 2D and trying to imagine what they would be in the real world is a, is a tough thing to do. And that's where, where you're going to see in a moment where we've, where we've come from. But where we're going is really, again, seeing these things, seeing these 3D models in the context of what is. So here's an overview of, of the way Presidio Parkway, that foundation actually has dealt with uh, the construction of this road widening that, that Ahmed started. First of all, they've got this website, presidioparkway.org, and they provide some graphic ways to show, and, and these are videos in this case, of what could be done. They also allow the, they also give the users some focus, so they have these uh, different uh, icons and, and titles and things like that to really provide some focus for what should people actually be looking at. And then, of course, lots of other useful information. So behind this is all the metadata. This is typical GIS metadata and other things to get people to understand this is what you're looking at and this is the information behind that. And finally, it's getting the story in front of the people who matter. Again, these are stakeholders, and stakeholders are just about anyone. They could be public officials, they could be the engineers or architects, but often they're also uh, citizens that need to be informed about what's going on. So here's how we do this today, and I'm going to run a video here. This is a video of Autodesk InfraWorks, where we've taken all that data that, that uh, Mike talked about, as well as the analysis and data that uh, Ahmed talked about, and we brought them in here. This is actually the Presidio Parkway and Doyle Drive here in San Francisco, running as a 3D model inside of the software. This is the, this is, that was the old, this is the new, and you see these new tunnels and all that stuff that Ahmed was talking about. The best part about what we've done here and bringing all this data and the analysis together is that we can start to create these scenarios by which our stakeholders can really visualize and, and, and see everything that's being planned in the context of what is. So there's no being left to the imagination anymore. This is, you see this person actually creating a, a, a fly-through. Here's a fly-through of that, of that thing. And, and that was being created in desktop software. Now as I switch over, you'll also see that it isn't just doing all this in desktop software and publishing a video, but also publishing this to the cloud via, you know, in the web 
to allow stakeholders to actually visualize and see this model for themselves without having any desktop software. So here's that same exact model, that same scenario, maybe a little choppy just because of this technology, that uh, the streaming technology here. But you're seeing here, I can play that same fly-through. Then this, you know, the most important thing to note here is this actually isn't a video. This is actually a fly-through of a real model. And during this, during this little fly-through, the user can stop, they can move around the model, they can really inspect the stuff that they, that they feel is important to them mm. to get an understanding of what that's all about. Justin, it's coming through remarkably well, but I just want to emphasize um, that we are, this is actually completely smooth in real life. It's just a little choppy because yep. we're showing it on GoToWebinar, but I'm really pleased with how well it's doing. <laughs> Great, yeah, it's, 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 it's okay on my side too. Mm -hmm. Great. So here, here I'm doing this. I'm, you know, it's not just about visualizing this stuff. Here I'm going to place that uh, that that fictitious Golden Gate Museum in in the scene. And based on that analysis that uh, Ahmed did, I'm placing this uh, 3D building in scene. And you'll see again, this this isn't just visualizing, right? Now I'm actually um, doing some conceptual design and design right in this model and even seeing light and shadow to see how this thing will actually perform, this building in this case, will perform in, this, in its environment. But I also may want to add other things, other elements to this. So here I'm adding some tree stands uh, and some other vegetation to gussy it up a bit, right? I want, to, I want to show people what this really looks like, and maybe I don't have all the plans yet for, uh, for the landscape. Uh, I'm adding a parking lot in this case. So I can add, start adding concepts for this, for you know, for this proposal or alternative, and in this case, this is a parking lot. As well as I can, you know, I can add some more roads and connect those roads to existing infrastructure. So this is all in an intelligent model, and in this, uh, I can add as many different elements as I want. I can change things on the fly, and what's really important in all of this is this isn't just sketching. This isn't two D sketching of line work. In fact, these roads are real. They are they are based on real engineering constraints, uh, and when I place them in this in this model, they connect to other roads and understand that they're roads and, and act like roads. So that was a really really quick demo of Autodesk InfraWorks to just give you an idea of of what's possible today. It isn't just about 2D anymore. It's about being able to bring all the 2D and 3D information together to you know actually show what you know what this might look like. So let me show you what's, what's actually behind this model that I just showed you. So behind this model that I just showed you, and I think we're on the next slide now, um, is some data. And it's really four different kinds of data. Underneath all of this data, the first thing you have to have is terrain. And terrain is the thing, you know, and this can come in a DEM or D DTM or, or really just about anything else. And that terrain is, is really giving that context for what the Earth looks like, right? And in this case, uh, I believe I grabbed some USGS data, and it gives you some context. On top of that, we throw in some imagery. That imagery can come in GeoTIFF or ASC or, or really just anything else. And again, the geo that imagery is going to provide the real world context. So where am I in the real world? Next, we've layered in some GIS. That GIS can be 2D. Uh, it can be 2.5D as well. And that will be sitting on top of the road or it can be extruded if it needs to be. And it, now I'm providing perhaps the, the roads and other kinds of uh, information that I need for further context. And finally, I've added 3D to this model. And 3D can come in the form of uh, you know, lots of different 3D data. It can come in Collada and FBX and Revit and, and other kinds of files. And here again, I'm just providing more context. But I'm providing all of this back to this intelligent model so that it understands where these things are. So even better, my stakeholders can understand where they are in this model and, and really what I'm trying to convey, the, the, the changes I'm trying to convey to them. So on this next slide, this is also about presenting this stuff visually, presenting these concepts and these designs in a really visual way. And presenting them visually means that I want to now take all of this, see all this information, this 3D model that, that you saw in the demonstration, and I want to build some, you know, some really visual scenarios, and, and we call them storyboards here, that 
not only can users now play with, they can play with the model and zoom and pan around just as they would in, in, uh, you know, in, in any other software, but I want to present some control and I want to be able to show them the concepts that, that are really, you know, are what, in, what, are, what are interesting. And perhaps these are the fly-throughs, perhaps it's that, all that other information I, I spoke about on the Presidio Parkway site. Um, and that would be the metadata and the titles and, and those kinds of things. And I could publish those things and I could publish them to video and I can publish them to, in other ways. So finally, the other ways are, are these. Perhaps I, I, I don't want to just publish them to video, but I want to actually give users a way to see these models in real time and perhaps even collaborate. So you saw the web there, but it's also about being able to publish these for mobile users. And we have a, an iPad app as well where you can download these scenarios and you can, and you can move around them visually. And it isn't just moving around and seeing these, these, these scenarios as I publish them. It's also about collaborating. So we've added some capability here whereby if the, you know, if the person who's actually published these models gives some rights, stakeholders can actually have this thing we call design feed, and they can drop little pins on the earth, and they can, act, they can start chatting back and forth and, and giving some, some ideas about what it is they see. Perhaps these are approvals. Perhaps these are issues or changes that need to be made in these, in these models and these scenarios. But again, it's all about visualizing these things, seeing, seeing the concepts in the, in the, within the context of the real world, and then collaborating on these things as stakeholders. So I think that's what I wanted to show. It was all about taking all that data that uh, Mike talked about coming from TomTom. Tom. In this case, some of, the, in fact, some of the buildings and I believe even some of the streets data came from TomTom, Tom, as well as the analytics, uh, and, and as well as maybe even some of the data that came from, uh, from what Ahmed was talking about in MapInfo Pro uh, from Pitney Bowes, and then bringing all that stuff together inside of Autodesk InfoWorks to create this realistic looking 3D model for design and conceptual design moving forward. Yeah, that's quite the, um, that's quite the workflow there, and it's quite the project too. That must have been quite uh, an intense project to get um, stakeholder buy-off on that um, on that project. It's oh, yeah. kind of an amazing oh, yeah. project. It took, it took a long yeah. time. Um, yeah. I think Not probably bad. yeah, most interesting about the, that project and, and these things going you know, uh, today is that these projects do take a long time. And mm -hmm. like that project took uh, more than 10 years to really just go through the planning phases. And so, wow. You know, mm -hmm. yep, yep. And I loved your first, the, the picture that you showed at the beginning with the people poking at the map. That was, that was yeah. really great. <laughs> Very visual. Um, uh, representation of what really happens in a process like that. So, okay, so we've got another poll for you. This is going to be our last one, and you guys have had a chance to take a look at this. Um, we want to know uh, whether integration is important or not. So um, these tools that uh, I've shown have been available in various formats. Not, not all of them, but some of them have been av available in various formats. Um, so we're wondering um, how important is it to integrate those? So the question is, is it important to have integrated data and tools to support a workflow? And so your choices are, yes, it's very important. Yes, it's somewhat important. I'm kind of more or less used to the old way of doing it, and I'm comfortable with it. So I'm still going to use the sneaker net. or. I don't really have any integrated workflows, so this doesn't really apply to me. And we have quite a few questions coming in. We really appreciate that. Um, so uh, go ahead and <clears throat> give us your response to that question when you have a chance. And, um, and we will start loading up some of your questions as well. Um, and I'm kind of dealing with some of those in the background right here as, we <laughs> as you guys are dealing with that. So if you hear me. Um, typing away, that's what that's all about. Um, so, okay, so, yeah, if you haven't voted, please go ahead and do so because I am going to close this up. All right, good. Okay, so here are the results of that. So 60% of you say it's very important to have um, a truly integrated um, data, set of data and tools to support your workflow. So some of what you've seen here um, 
are um, would be uh, appropriate for you. Um, another 25% of you or so say it's somewhat important. Um, there's just one person out there saying he's used to the speaker net and can live with that. Um, and then 13% of you don't have any integrated workflows, so um, that wouldn't apply in your case. Um, Anyways, I'm going to go ahead and hide that. And we do have um, some resources to make you aware of. So if you have specific um, questions um, after this webinar, please do email our speakers. And um, I'll, you don't have to worry about um, jotting these down. Um, but I will include all of these emails in the um, thank you note that I send out to you tomorrow. We also have um, some URLs there for you to visit to learn a little bit more about some of the products that have been discussed. Um, and then on the next slide, we have a, a, a case study with the Virginia Department of uh, Transportation using TomTom's historical traffic data that we thought might be of interest to some of you. There's another webinar that we meant to put on there, but I bumbled it. I'm sorry. Um, but I'm going to pop it into your uh, chat boxes. And it is uh, a um, webinar that we did um, last, um, last year with the city of Vancouver and them using an integrated workflow um, for municipal government and infrastructure management. So I'm going to pop that into your um, chat box as we get into our questions. And a lot of you are bringing questions in. And by the way, I wanted to mention um, Mary, Tim, Tracy, and Jeff. I've gotten your, um, your requests for a certificate. So thanks for that. We will get those out to you. Um, all right, let's get into some of these questions. Um, if I could have everybody come back up. So Scott wants to know, is InfraWorks a different product than Infrastructure Manager? And I think that's to you, Justin. Yeah, so that's a great question. I, what I didn't say was that Autodesk InfraWorks is a, is, a, is a new name for what used to be Autodesk Infrastructure Modeler. So we've actually rebranded the name. Okay. Uh, and that is a new name. And uh, it, there's also a cloud and uh, a cloud part of that called Autodesk InfraWorks 360. But that that's a great question. It is a new name for what was yeah. Autodesk Infrastructure Modeler. So Olaf, I think that uh, answers your question too, because you more or less had that same question. Great. Um, so Scott wants to know. Oh, I already did that one. Steve wants to know, are you using Infrastructure Design Modeler as a modeling app? And InfraWorks is the cloud to collaborate using that model? Can you kind of get into that? So it sounds like the, almost the same question. It's, um, it's, all, it's all one. So Autodesk InfraWorks is a, is a design and conceptual design app, you know, all 3D. And it's, there's the, the desktop component is where you're doing the design. Uh, conceptual design analysis and stuff like that, mm -hmm. uh, including building the actual models. There's another piece of that called Autodesk InfraWorks 360, and Autodesk InfraWorks 360 is the cloud portion. So uh, where you're storing, you can store these these models and the proposals and scenarios and so forth in the cloud, and then you can you can publish those so that uh, uh, stakeholders can get get to them via web and, and mobile interfaces. Okay. Um, and uh, let's see here. We have a lot of questions kind of getting into the topic of the importance of integration. I wonder if I could kind of just throw that out generally um, for, uh, for the group to, to kind of to talk about um, what are the pros, cons, difficulties, et cetera, et cetera, in terms of trying to integrate all of these tools. Pros, cons. Um, I, I would say that, that yeah, there's <laughs> so that's a big question. There's, mm -hmm. um, I, I don't see any cons. So it's it's really pros. So we could sort of start with the very beginning, and then maybe others can add some color commentary. But mm -hmm. first and foremost, um, you know, all of this all of this work and in, in planning all the way through design, of course, starts with data, and data is at the center of everything that that all three of our companies deal with. Um, so all that starts with data. TomTom, Tom, of course, has, if we're talking about buildings and, and, and traffic and 
uh, and, and infrastructure, those kinds of things. TomTom Tom just so happens to have an incredible set of traffic data and real time and also historical traffic data that, that you, might, you might use to figure out where things go. Map info, you know, from Pitney Bowes and, and Paramix then sits on top of that and and provides the you know the scenario management for and the analysis for taking that data and doing different kinds of analytics to decide perhaps where to put things, right? Proposed mm -hmm. areas to to place infrastructure or buildings or whatever it might be. Um, that branches right into what we just what I just showed you with InfraWorks and, and again there's no cons to that. I would say only, only, only pros in that InfraWorks can then take all of that data, including the analytics data that was created, perhaps new, new data was created in uh, Pitney Bowes, MapInfo Pro, and, and Paramix, can take the output of that and bring it into the, you know, the InfraWorks software to then create the, the 3D modeling environment, the 3D visuals, as well as something now that you can do more conceptual design. So, they, they actually all fit together well, and today they fit together by via the data. That data can actually flow through each. So while you don't necessarily launch InfraWorks from Pitney Bowes, the output of the Pitney Bowes software can be brought right into InfraWorks, and I think Ahmed covered that as well. And the, all the data that TomTom Tom collects and creates, uh, most of that can fit into both, both uh, environments as well. So okay. they all sort of fit together. Okay, Ahmed, um, Mike, you might guys might want to comment on this as well. Yeah, absolutely, this is Ahmed. Um, I would absolutely agree. It's only uh, positive, um, you know, attributes about about this partnership, about the integration uh, of the workflow. Uh, because historically, we when we were talking to our customers and other uh, users of our technology, we realized that it's actually not the, not the use of the technology, the individual technology stacks from Pitney Bowes software or Autodesk software. It's really about um, uh, the data integration and interoperability effort that our users um, out there um, spend their time doing. And between the, the three of us, we provide you know data analysis tools, design tools. So we have more than enough uh, tools and capabilities to cater uh, to our customer-specific needs in that particular industry. What they really need is more, not more tools or capabilities, but more efficiency, right, in doing their work. Mm -hmm. Now, integrating the first, and, and, and again, that's the first phase of our partnership, is to actually make our products talk to each other, integrate with each other, and you can have this seamless transboundary data flow throughout the whole product um, uh, and project life cycle from visioning and planning all the way to implementation, as well as uh, after even implementation. Um, so the idea is to eliminate that layer of inefficiency in the, in the workflow and make our uh, customers and the users um, in, in this industry uh, more efficient and uh, increase their, their, uh, their productivity level. Great. Mike, anything you want to add um, um, on that one? Yeah, I mean, just very briefly, I think it's been covered quite well uh, by Justin and, and Ahmed, but uh, I, I think the spatial coherency uh, on the TomTom -tom side of the base data, uh, so if we think about maps, the, the streets, um, everything is spatially uh, rectified between the 2D maps, the 3D maps, the streets layer within the, uh, the base map. Uh, when it comes to applying traffic data, that's not something that's easily done, but um, you know, we've really made our bread and butter with respect to um, applying traffic data accurately. Um, so from the collection of that data to the fusion of that data and then to its spatial application on the map. Um, and, and then thirdly, I'd say with our geographic coverage, uh, again, going back to the global uh, footprint that we have. Mm -hmm. um, and I also think that you know, the data is contiguous through the the design scales that were mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, James wants to know, oh, and by the way, I just put my email into the chat box. If you want the certificate, please do drop me an email. That's going to help me a bunch. I don't know if I'm going to be able to collect all of your requests from the chat box. It'll be easier for me to do that if you send me an email, so please do do that. Um, and let's see, James wants to know, when you add in 3D models, can you also add in BIM data? Can you add in BIM data? That the answer is absolutely yes. So, BIM BIM data, of course, is also that's a broad question. BIM data can be lots of different things, but mm -hmm. typically we're talking about 
building information modeling data that might be Revit data, uh, you know, with with some intelligence. It, but BIM can also be, you know, civil infra infrastructure. So uh, maybe BIM data could be coming from civil 3D a road designed in that. And the answer is absolutely. This was designed. Infraworks was designed for for that, which was bring in whatever data you have, uh, including you know typical GIS data to create the scene, even two and a half D data. So you could be bringing in buildings for context that are footprints with a, you know, with an elevation or something, and it will automatically extrude all the buildings in the city. But you could also be bringing in Revit, uh, Revit data or simple 3D data that then provides, you know, some real intelligence, and not just a 3D model, but the the intelligence behind that 3D model. So, uh, yep, mm -hmm. that is a long way of saying absolutely. Okay. And Darren wants to know, can the traffic flow models be integrated into the 3D fly-throughs? Can the traffic flow models be integrated into fleet 3D fly-throughs? Um, the traffic flow models, there are probably different ways to do some of that. Um, you can do theming and uh, those kinds of things inside of InfraWorks. So you can do some of that. As far as Animated traffic flow. We don't we don't have a cap capability today to do animated traffic flows, but you can bring in the you know the analytics that came from some of what uh, uh, what Ahmed showed you, and, and perhaps even some of what TomTom uh, Tom might be able to provide, and we could do some theming mm -hmm. on that in three D. Okay, I'm just going to keep cruising on through here, guys. But do stop me if somebody else wants to address one of these questions. John wants to know what is the common data format that conforms with the BIM process, or is it just that the systems can read other formats? It's really that it can read other formats. There isn't a common format uh, for, for BIM. And there are, BIM is also broad, right? BIM is like GIS. Mm -hmm. So it's broad. It means lots of things. But it's a, it's a, BIM is typically a process more than a format of, of, for building information modeling. Um, and in that process, you may be creating data in lots of different formats. And, and uh, InfraWorks will bring in uh, a bunch of those formats, as well as all the GIS and, and other kinds of formats. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, Kathleen wants to know, does LIDAR factor into the models? Certainly, yeah. LIDAR is great. Mm -hmm. LIDAR is great for this sort of thing. And, and InfraWorks can bring in LIDAR, too. So uh, I didn't show anything with LIDAR, but you, you know, now imagine that you are you know, you're showing what could be in the context of what is. Often the context of what is is coming directly from LIDAR. So certainly I could bring in LIDAR into uh, InfraWorks, and I can use that LIDAR to represent a, a part of the model. I could be, you know, represent buildings, so a whole city's worth of buildings. Mm -hmm. um, and when I bring LIDAR into InfraWorks, it's not just bringing the points, but it's bringing all the, uh, the classification data, too. So. I okay. could then be theming on intensity or elevation or, or whatever else is in that classified data. OK. This next one's a pretty big question. Thomas wants to ask for advice on database software to store 3D model buildings in multiple levels of detail for a large area like an entire city. How does this workflow relate to city uh, GML? The open format develops um, in Europe for yeah. similar city visualizations. Yeah, that's a great question. I don't have an answer. <laughs> so the you know we see lots of people using city GML as a standard as an OGC standard. Mm -hmm. uh, we see certainly lots of people using that, and, and InfoWorks can connect uh, and bring in city GML data. Um, I haven't seen a great answer yet for large scale cities. So InfoWorks uh, b by itself uh, actually has its own database. It's uh, mm -hmm. in fact it uses a SQLite database to store and manage. Um, it's its own model, so it's data-driven. It's a database-driven system, but it, there, you know, we haven't seen a really good standard yet for storing large amounts of 3D data in a s scalable and efficient way. Oracle, mm -hmm. of course, has some great stuff that in, in Oracle Spatial. City GML is is, uh, is is good and supported by InfraWorks, but none of them are are perfect yet. So I would say, yeah. you know, keep looking. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, we're just about at the top of the hour, but I'm going to try to do one more question. Um, and I apologize to everybody whose questions we didn't get to, but do uh, recall that we have the emails of the speakers in um, on that previous slide, and I will be sending those out to you, um, those emails as well. And don't forget, you can download a PDF of the slides. So if you want to grab those 
um, emails. If you want to grab that PDF right now, you can do that. And I'm going to be closing up the webinar in just a minute. So, um, uh, but that URL will be good. Will continue to be good probably forever. I don't take the slides down, so you're welcome to grab those at any point. Um, let's see. So let's go ahead and do. Um, trying to figure out which one of these might be the most. Uh, useful for everybody. Um, can the approved integrated workflows be used for preliminary design purposes and eventually incorporated into engineering design plans? Ooh, great, great question to end on. Uh, absolutely. In fact, this was this was this whole system was built for that. So, the the whole system, including what what uh, Ahmed showed you in with uh, Map Info and Paramics. You start out with planning, you bring that, you, and, and the output of that, the, that plan data comes right into in, InfraWorks here. Uh, and then from within InfraWorks, you can actually be creating and adding new data, and under the covers of InfraWorks, it can be also using, it can also, it can also use a, uh, a civil engineering engine, right? So the rules engine that actually is based on civil engineering rules like Ashto. Uh, I could actually be then designing new infrastructure, tweaking things, uh, and, and creating these proposals alternatives inside of InfoWorks, and the output of that actually can, can go right into a product like AutoCAD Civil 3D uh, and it, open that in Civil 3D where it can, can be further refined in detailed design as a plan set. So, in fact, absolutely it's built that way. Uh, mm -hmm. Once this stuff gets into InfraWorks and you output it from InfraWorks, it's no longer just plan data. In fact, it can become real design data in InfraWorks. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, well, I think that we're going to have to leave it there, um, although I have to say that was a really fascinating case study with the Presidio Parkway. I'd love to hear more about it, but I am afraid we are at the top of the hour. Um, and I did have a comment from John. He does say that Paramex does do 3D fly-throughs, so that was back at that one question that got asked a little while ago about the um, traffic data and the fly-throughs. And so um, I've got a lot of requests for uh, certificates. Please go ahead and email me those. Those have helped me a whole bunch. And it looks like we are at the top of the hour. And I just want to thank everybody who attended and also our speakers, Mike, Ahmed, Justin, and everybody. Great job. I just want to remind everybody that we'll be sending out a note tomorrow with the links and the emails mentioned during this webinar. And of course, there'll be a link to the recording as well. And until next time, this is your moderator, Nora Parker. Thanks for coming. And be sure to tell a friend about Directions Magazine. And bye for now. <laughs>